Pastor Delbert's on vacation, a uh, well-deserved vacation. You don't realize how much goes into uh, having to study and put together the sermons and teachings and books and CDs and all the things that we do here, and then, of course, all the presentations we do. And uh, I mean, it's almost a full-time production job just putting together the service. So uh, well-deserved vacation, and I hope that uh, he's having fun. I know he is getting some relaxation in, but he always does what he does, and that's he continues to study while he's there. That gives him some time to reflect. And uh, so we're going to continue our look at David. He and I talked about uh, what we're going to continue on, and uh, he kind of gave me some liberty to look at David in a different way. So I want to have a little fun today. I want to lighten things up a little bit, okay? So we're going to look at David, and what I'm calling this is David, a king's declaration, okay? Who's sick of the politics? It's going on right now. If you're not raising your hand, then you're probably not being honest. Huh? Sick of all the election stuff, right? I mean, it's every day, day in, day out, we're just barraged with commercials. And, I mean, we turned the television on this morning, and here they were talking about the candidates. This candidate says this and believes this. This candidate says this and believes that. And, you know, I'm not here to push any political view because, quite honestly, I'm not thrilled with either one of them at this point. So... Just to be honest with you, it hadn't been for a while um, because of the direction that we've kind of been going with uh, some of the leadership in our country, amen? And so as I began to meditate on what I wanted to share this morning or what God wanted uh, to have us share this morning, I started looking at David and some of his leadership qualities and some of the things that made David the king because he is called, I mean, we still call him now, what, thousands of years later, we call him King David, right? So when you talk about David, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind was, is King David. And then uh, the second thing is a man after God's own heart. I mean, most of the time, your preachers and ministers, well, they talk about David being a man after God's own heart. But if you talk to most lay people in the church, most, most churchgoers, they think King David, right? And if you look at his, his leadership style, David was an interesting king. Amen? I mean, he had a lot of different qualities that made him king. Of course, you know how he came about being king. Um, it was also very interesting, but uh, I want to look at a little, something a little bit different today. We're going to talk about David as if he were running for president of the United States. Okay? Isn't that going to be interesting? It's going to be fun, right? So anyway, I'm just, I'm just kind of sick of the whole uh, political thing and the way it's been spun around today. Um, talk about issues, you know, things like environmentalism. Uh, we talk about things like the economy, which has everybody uh, um, all upset and about way, the way the economy is going. And don't get me wrong, I don't like losing money either, but uh, God's in control. Amen? I mean, if you look at it this way, the money's not ours anyway. It's his. You know, everything here is his. So basically, we're just left as stewards of it, right? So we're going to look at some things and, uh, and maybe how David would approach this whole political campaign mess. We'll talk about Psalm 33, 12 right quick, though, and this is something that's very important for a nation, and this is where our nation, I think, is starting to kind of teeter on some issues. Psalm 33, 12 says, blessed is the nation whose God is, help me out, the Lord, right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So if you look at that literally, you could say then the nation whose God is not the Lord is not blessed, Right? Uh, how long has it been since you've heard one of our political leaders stand up before the entire nation and say, our God is the Lord? Now think about that. It's been a while, right? You know, usually President Bush, when he does some kind of uh, speech, he'll mention God. He'll, he'll talk about his uh, relationship with God. But it's been a long, long time since somebody has actually stood up in our country and declared our nation worships the Lord. And what it is, we've got this whole political correctness thing going that says, well, you don't have to be tolerant. have to be tolerant, tolerant, tolerant. Well, that only brings us so far. And then we cease to become a blessed nation because we stop focusing on the Lord. Amen? So we want to talk about what if David were running for president. Now, for, uh, for namesake, we're going to call him David King. Okay? So... For our election today, our candidate running for president is David King. And David shows up at a town hall meeting, and he's going to be addressing the issues to the moderator who's going to be in this debate. Amen? So we won't look at the other side, what the other side's going to say. We're going to look at how maybe David would approach this. Now, let's think about David for a minute. 
If David were running for president, would you vote for him? Okay. I, I'm, I'm asking, would you vote for David as president of the United States? He's murdered, okay, killed people. The Bible says ten thousands. And we know of one he sent off to his death because he took his wife in as a concubine. So David had illicit sexual affairs, right? Also had an illegitimate child from that. So would you vote for David as president? How often does that issue come up in our presidential campaign? Every day. Sick of hearing it. I am so sick of hearing it. You look at David and how great David was and how we still talk about him thousands of years later and his leadership qualities. And we know all that stuff that he did, and yet he was still king, right? Well, here's, here i got news for you. I didn't vote for some of the presidents, but they were still president, right? So point being is that maybe there's a little bit going on behind the scenes as far as God is concerned at choosing our president. Now, I will say this. If the nation strays... If the nation goes in a direction that is not necessarily godly, then God could step back and say, you know what, if that's what you really want, that's what you'll have as president. He's done that historically, right? He stepped back from a nation because just the opposite of the, of the scripture we just looked at, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When that nation begins to stray away from the principles of the Lord, then God steps back and says, okay, you get what you asked for, Right? So let's get into our debate. Let's look at it from that standpoint. Let's kind of see where David would go with these issues. And I chose a passage. It's one that we use uh, anytime we're kind of depressed. And, you know, David, David probably went through a lot of depression. I mean, he was a songwriter. He wrote a uh, majority of the Psalms. Scholars agree probably, you know, 70% of the Psalms David wrote. And if you look at those Psalms, and as I began to read and study through the Psalms that he wrote, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a songwriter and a singer, so kind of wanted to find some common ground between David and I. And, boy, as I read some of those things, and most of them are just blues. Oh, they really are. And, and don't get me wrong, I like blues, but it, it comes to a point where it gets depressing. And so you can obviously see where David was expressing his depression in some of those songs. He talked about how bad it was for his enemies to come and whoop up on him. How bad it was to have straight away and done things he shouldn't have done and then got, got spanked for it by the Lord. But you know, 90% of it he did to himself. So basically, he's singing the blues in most of those psalms. See, I'm trying to make this modern for us, right? Because we kind of get that. We kind of understand. And if you actually, back in that time, you know, most of those were kind of chants anyway. They wasn't really, didn't really have a lot of... of uh, Music written down to it. You had a lot of the chants, so they would do things like, ah, and they would repeat it, and it was kind of monotone. So if you listen to some of that stuff, and you can hear kind of some of the Middle Eastern uh, music nowadays, and it kind of reflects that, but that's basically the way it was. So he would kind of chant something, and they would kind of chant it back, and they would get in this big chant thing. Well, David sang the blues. I mean, he did a lot until he gets to Psalm 23, and this is one we use, you know, when we're depressed, we kind of look at Psalm 23, and we start talking about, uh, about how this, this really, you know, the Lord can really strengthen me and bring me up and get me out of the blues. So we're going to go at it from that standpoint. David is going to be addressing our moderator who's going to ask him the questions that the candidates would have answered in our debate, right? But David's going to use psalms. He's going to use one of his best psalms. So the moderator's going to ask him, well, David, what qualifies you to lead? And David says, well... The Lord is my shepherd. Now think about it. David knew sheep. David is talking from the standpoint of a sheep. Even though he was a king and a leader and a mighty, mighty warrior, he knew sheep because he had attended to the flock many, many times. He had fought off predators. He had fought off the, uh, the lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh, my, that came after the sheep. So David knew sheep. David knew that sheep were almost... So dependent upon the shepherd that they wouldn't even eat unless the shepherd got them there and fed them. Most of the time. They just kind of hang around. But you think about sheep and their qualities. Providing the wool, you know, and uh, sometimes food. So the warmth and the food. But David knew sheep, that being the point. So what David says is, well, I'm going to put myself in the position of being a sheep. Someone who is led by a qualified leader. Amen? So David is saying, I'm a sheep, and so by being that sheep, I was taught how to lead through one of the best shepherds you'll ever have, 
The Lord is my shepherd. You see where I'm coming from here? See where he's coming from? The Lord taught me how to lead, David says. You think about it. Every time David made a major decision, especially when it comes to leading the nation, he would go and say, inquire of the Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Wouldn't it be refreshing to have a leader in our country that would stand up and say, I'm going to find out what the Lord wants us to do? Wouldn't that be refreshing? It would be so refreshing to me just to have someone look at the moderator and say, you know what, I love the Lord with all my heart. And so I'm going to find direction through him. Oh, well, that would be politically incorrect. Well, so what? I can be offended just like everyone else, right? So it's time for the Christians to stand up. God-fearing, God-loving, Lord-loving people to say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is our leader. Because blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. So David would say something like that. Well, the Lord's my shepherd. That's how I learn how to lead. Amen? Because after all, John 10, Jesus said, uh, said this. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. Who is he talking about? Talking about real sheep? Absolutely not. We call Jesus the good shepherd. He is our leader. He teaches us leadership. Amen? So we need a leader, a candidate, who will stand up and say, I get my leadership abilities through the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So that's question number one. Imagine the response that the crowd would give if somebody did that. Okay, second question he asked. Well, what are your concerns regarding the economy and the environment and health care? And I always find this very interesting. Who created the heavens and the earth? God did, right? So can you destroy it? Do you have the power to destroy it? Absolutely not. I find that very fascinating how someone can stand there and tell somebody that we are destroying the earth when we didn't create the earth. God did. He created it. He alone holds the power to destroy it. And it's so funny, every time we think, or I say man thinks, let me correct that, every time certain men think, they've got all this figured out as far as the global warming and all that goes, something changes. Well, who do you think is making those changes? Amen. Amen. It's kind of interesting, Book of Romans says, and it's not on your screen, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Book of Romans says, thinking themselves to be wise, they became as fools, and they worship and serve the creature instead of the creator of those creatures. It says, and, when, and in doing so, they act like fools. And so just when they think they got all this figured out, God changes something. I love it, love it, love it. You know, we go through the dry spells where we have the droughts, and then we'll go through spells where it rains for six months. Well, that's global warming. Well, then it'll be 20 degrees one day and then 80 the next year. Yeah, he just kind of, I think he just does it for humor a lot of times. Just trying to trick them a little bit. Going, huh, you think you got it figured out? See if you can figure this out. Something interesting my wife brought up. There are areas that have ice where it's never rained. Now explain that to me. Areas on the earth where there are ice, but it's never rained there. And it still doesn't rain. Or snow, but there's ice there. Who did that? Who can put ice where there is no water? Amen? Who can put water where there is no water? Because, see, he controls everything. He is in control. So our candidate would answer something like this. Well, I see it this way. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Amen? So is God out of riches? Will he ever run out of riches? Absolutely not. So what are we worried about? Yeah, I lost $5,000 in my 401k, so who's got all the riches? God does. Will you get it back? Yes, and then some. Because right now, he is showing people who is in control. Amen? We all worried about running out of gas. Well, guess who won't run out of gas? God. Who put the oil there? I love it. They say, we got enough oil to last us 60 years. Wouldn't it be great if it just kept pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping and God just kept putting oil there? You know, five fishes. Look, look what five fishes fed. We only have five fish. Oh, really? Well, let's feed 5,000 people. 
Well, we can't. We just got five fish. Well, you keep pulling them out, and we'll just keep feeding people. Think about that. Say, I'm not even worried about gas. I got two legs. God gave me two legs. Run out of gas, ride a bicycle. So that's kind of foreign to us, right? How about walking? Well, I work 30 miles away. You'll be in good shape. Want to lose weight? <laughs> Walk to work. But it's cold outside, so put on a coat. Right? I mean, this makes sense. It's just very simple things in God. How about a candidate that would look and say, well, you ever thought about walking? But I like this one. It's my favorite. Well, alternative fuels. That's the way to go. <laughs> my boat don't run off alternative fuel. Mm -hmm. You imagine Pastor Delbert down there running an electric boat in the ocean? Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't, yeah, he'd be real happy, wouldn't he? Out there doing about two miles an hour across the ocean. See, they don't think about those things because we don't control the flow of oil. God does. Amen? He controls it all. It's so funny to me. Well, we, we've got all this figured out. Oh, really? Something changes. So having a candidate to look at him and say, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory. Why? Because I honor him. That's why. I honor him. I give him the credit for owning all the oil and all the cattle and all the hills and the whole earth belongs to him. So I'm just using basically what he provides for me. And guess what? He's not going to run out of resources. The banks may run out of money. The economy may run out of money. But I promise you this, God won't. God will not. He'll never run out. He's a resource we can't un uh, tap out. What about this? Moderator asks, well, from whom do you look most for your direction? And of course, we'll keep on. He says, well, you know, God's true to his name. He leads us along the right paths. So if we trust in the promises of the Lord, he will direct our paths. Amen? So Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't you love that? Thank God. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean to your own understanding. You see, that's where we've been making the big mistake. We think we have it all figured out. Candidates think, oh, we got this whole thing figured out. Well, nope. You don't need to trust in your own understanding. You need to lean on the Lord. Amen? You need to take this country in a direction where we begin to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Don't lean on our own understanding because we'll never figure it out. Only He has the answer, and only He can direct our paths in the way we need to go. I mean, that's the bottom line. So trust in the Lord with all your heart, he would say. Don't lean on what you understand because I promise you something's going to change. And then you'll wonder why it's changing. Because God is in control of it, that's why. What about terrorism? Well, that's a big one. What are your plans to fight terrorists? The uh, candidate would answer, well, we may walk through valleys as dark as death, but we won't be afraid because he's with us. And his shepherd rod makes us feel safe. The Lord is on our side. If he is for us, then who can be against us? Amen? So he is our safety. He is our security. He is who we trust to keep us safe. Shepherd's rod was always something that the shepherd used to fight off the uh, enemies that would come in and attack the sheep. Amen? The sheep didn't fight. They didn't have to because the shepherd would fight for them. If you ever notice in the battles of the Old Testament, and well, even in the New Testament when they would have conflicts, but in the battles of the Old Testament, the Lord would provide the strategy. Isn't that interesting? All the battles where they would win, they would come up with a big win, big W in the W category there. It was God who gave them the instructions on how to do it. Every time they tried it on their own and they went out and did something on their own, it would always end up in some kind of defeat because they wouldn't do it God's way. See, so that's the whole point of that. The shepherd's rod is strong. The shepherd's rod is our protection. The shepherd's rod is what gives us direction in defeating our enemies. Jesus said something very interesting about enemies. He says, love your enemies. And we go, what? Can we love terrorists? You're supposed to. So how do you defeat them? Through love. 
I mean, we fight back physically. Don't get me wrong. I'm a firm believer in that. But we have to start showing everyone that our nation loves the Lord. And in doing so, the Lord puts up his hedge of protection around us. Amen? Sometimes we let our guard down and we let things happen that that shouldn't happen because we've strayed away from the principles of loving the Lord, following his direction. So we may walk through the valleys as dark as death, 9-11, very dark valley, but we'll always come out of it as long as we worship God. Amen? As long as we follow the Lord's principles. So we're to love our enemies. And that's Matthew five forty three. Jesus says, when you do that, then you heap coals of fire on their heads. That's always kind of interesting. You want to really get after your enemy? Love them. Do something different to them. All right, next question. So how would you fight world hunger? That's always another one, too. You know, we throw away more food most of the time at a uh, restaurant than most places would get to eat in months. So we're a very blessed nation when it comes to food. I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip on you. I'm just trying to get you to look at it when you start thinking, well, we're, we're in trouble. Well, think about the countries that don't even have enough to eat. And we throw away more food than they'll ever get 90% of the time. So anyway, fighting world hunger, how would you do it? Well, you know, we, we're going to seek God's kingdom. What we want to do is establish God's kingdom in areas where there's world hunger. Amen? Because the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom, and everything else will be added to you. Let's, look, let's read this passage. I think this is a very good one. Matthew 6, 25 says this, Therefore I say unto you, it's Jesus talking, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, what you shall wear, your clothing. It's not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment or clothing. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them, or feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to your stature? You can't get taller just by thinking, wishing it, right? Worrying over it. And why take you thought for your clothes or raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they even spin. They don't even make their own clothes, but look how pretty they are. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of those lilies. You see, we focus on the wrong things a lot of times. Focus on me, 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 my, 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 new car, new house, new boat, new trucks, new clothes. What am I going to eat? And Jesus says, don't focus on that stuff. I'll provide all of that. And you see, I am firmly convinced that that's what's wrong with a lot of the countries that don't worship the Lord. They wonder why they're starving to death. They don't worship the Lord. That's why. Because he will take care of all this. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which to this day is, and is tomorrow, is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought. This is it. What you shall eat. What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. All those things do people who don't necessarily believe in the Lord being their shepherd seek after that stuff. That's their focus. You want to solve world hunger? Introduce them to the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you that will take care of it. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, all the food, all the clothing, everything you need will be added to it. And see, our nation has been blessed for so long because our founding fathers sought after the Lord. If you go back and historically look, they sought after the Lord. Everything they did was seeking after the Lord. When they came over to this nation, or this land, and began to establish a na nation that was basically seeking after the Lord. Now, we can look at all the little faults they did, like David. David had all of his problems, but they established something that is great. Amen? And as a matter of fact, you look at some of the journals from Christopher Columbus. He thought he had discovered the New Jerusalem when he found this land. It was so great. I mean, it's actually a land that literally flowed with milk and honey. So, we're in a great country. We're in a country that needs to continue to seek after the Lord. When we stand on those principles, I promise we'll make right decisions. We won't have to worry about any of that uh, contemporary problems. So the moderator would ask him this final question. He says, how do you see our nation for the long term? Well, isn't that interesting? How do you see our nation long term? And I don't mean the next four or five, six years. We can survive four years of a presidency. We can survive eight years of a presidency. We've done it. 
You know, we've made it through eight years of presidencies that we didn't necessarily agree with, but we made it through it, didn't we? So what are we even really worried about when it comes to that stuff? What we need to do is start convincing people to worship and follow after the principles of the Lord. That's where our focus comes in. So the moderator is going to ask him, how do you see uh, the nation for the long term? And he would say something like this. Well, you know, his kindness, talking about God, and love will always be with us. Each day of our lives, and we will live forever in his house. You see, all that I've just gone through is Psalm chapter 23. Except it's phrasing it in a way that we understand what it says today. He'll provide everything we need, and we'll just live in his house forever. Because after all, it's his house anyway. It's really ours. We're just borrowing it. We're just staying here. God owns it. So again, Psalm 33, 12 says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Simple, right? So you think it would be. And just once, I'd love to have a candidate that would look straight into that camera, right into the faces of the American people and go, you know what? Our nation will be blessed if we will follow the Lord. So now I want to do something kind of different. I want to bring up this entire passage, and this is the new contemporary version, the contemporary English version. So I want to read the contemporary English version of Psalm 23 and see if it doesn't kind of drive a little bit deeper into your your thinking. Amen? Say it this way. Make it a little more personal. It says, You, Lord, are my shepherd, and I will never be in need. You let me rest in fields of green grass. You lead me to streams of peaceful waters. You refresh my life, and you are true to your name. You lead me along the right paths, and I may walk through valleys as dark as death, but I won't be afraid, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod makes me feel safe. You treat me to a feast while my enemies watch, and you honor me as your guest. You fill my cup until it overflows. Your kindness and love will always be with me each day of my life, and I will live forever in your house, Lord. Doesn't that kind of change your whole outlook? about the way that you you look at life, you look at how you're living, you look at what's going on around you today, then that kind of give you just a little bit of hope. See, David needed that, and I think we need that. You know, stop worrying about all the stuff, because that's all I've been hearing the last couple of weeks. Lord, I don't know what we're going to do. You're right, the Lord knows what we're going to do. And maybe it's time just to put all of your I-can-fix-it mentality away and say, let's just let the Lord fix it. Let's just lean on the Lord. Let's just trust in the Lord. Let's just let Him control things for a change and stop trying to control it ourselves. Amen? Wouldn't that be so much better? Wouldn't our nation be so much better? You know, no matter what happens in the next couple of weeks, whoever wins the election, like I said, I really don't, you know, I'm kind of indifferent at this point. Let's just trust in the Lord. Let's just focus on Him. Let's focus on His principles. Let's live the way He wants us to live. And then in doing so, we can turn our nation around to a nation that trusts the Lord. Amen? So stand with me. We'll do something a little bit different and pray for everyone about the entire situation. And just want to ask the Lord to uh, relieve us of any concerns about what's going on around us and as far as everything goes and remind ourselves and everyone around that God is in control. Father, we just lift you up now. Lord, we focus everything we have on you. Lord, we understand your kingdom principles, and we ask, Lord, that you make those known to each and everyone around us, Lord, in a much more clear and direct way. Father, we thank you for what you're already doing. Lord, we know that no matter what, you're in control. We know that no matter... uh, how the money goes, you control it, Lord. We know that no matter how gasoline and all that silly stuff goes, that you're in control of it, Lord. We just ask that you open the hearts of our people, Lord, of our nation. Lord, we ask that we be a light and a direction, and Lord, that it's time for the church to shake itself awake, to make itself known, Lord, in a 
in a more direct and powerful way. Father, I thank you for what you're already doing. I can already see changes. I can already see uh, direction changing, Lord, through your spirit. And I just ask that you touch everyone and, and give them that peace, Lord, that passes all understanding. Show them the green grass. Show them the green fields. Show them the peaceful waters, Lord. Bless each and every one that's here, not only in this church, but in every church around, Lord, no matter what. We just ask that our nation come back to you, that our nation be a nation that trusts the Lord. Amen. Well, this would be a really great time if you don't know the Lord as your shepherd to make him your shepherd. Amen. Be a time to say, Lord, I'm a sheep that needs a shepherd. I've wandered. I haven't been fed spiritually. I haven't been fed. I need you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, I want to pray for you. We all want to pray for you. So if you're that sheep and you need the shepherd more than anything right now, just raise your hand. We'll be happy to pray with you. Amen. Amen. Everybody just pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you've done, Lord. We thank you that you've given your life as the good shepherd. And Lord, right now I submit my life to you as a sheep that needs the Good Shepherd.